Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Minute Chocolate Mug Cake. That's right, and by minute, I mean 45 seconds. And while I'm not the actual inventor of this method, I do play that person on the internet. And I think you're gonna be very excited at what I've done here, because unlike most versions of this instant cake, this one does not have the texture of a hockey puck. All right, so check it out. This really is kind of amazing. So step one, we're of course gonna make our cake batter. We're gonna start with one whole egg and some sugar, of course. We're also gonna want a little pinch of salt, very small pinch, which is gonna to totally bring out the flavor in the next ingredient, which is the cocoa. So we're gonna use some unsweetened cocoa, very high quality, please. I'm using something called Coco Rouge, which sounds French, so you know it's good. All right, after the cocoa, we're gonna add a little bit of vegetable oil and a little bit of melted butter, and we're gonna give that a whisking. All right, so that's the first step. We're still gonna to need to add a little bit of milk along with some flour and baking powder. But before we do, we're gonna decide if we wanna add any extras. All right, so I'm gonna fancy mine up with a little bit of coconut, a little bit of toasted sliced almond, and some semi-sweet chocolate chips. Okay, so I was using a certain candy bar as my inspiration here. And by the way, you don't buy toasted sliced almonds, you just take some sliced almonds raw, toast them in a dry pan over medium heat until they're golden. Only takes a couple minutes. All right, you can smell when they're done, they smell awesome. But anyway, like I said, once that first step is mixed, you can go ahead and add pretty much anything into here. So I went with coconut, almond, chocolate chip, and then we're gonna add a little splash of milk and mix that in. All right, so I'm gonna take a spatula and or spoonula and mix that thoroughly. And then finally, we are ready to add the flour. But first, we're gonna add a little bit of baking powder to it, and you're gonna to wanna to sift that together or just do what I'm doing. Take your freakishly small metal whisk and give it about a 30 second stir. And of course, if you're not licensed to own one of those, there's only 14 people in the world that are. You can just use a fork. Works almost as good. All right, so stir that up and then pour that over your batter. And then we're gonna take the spatula and we are gonna mix it in, but we're not gonna over mix it. And what the inside of your brain should sound like while you're doing this is, I can still see flour, keep stirring. I can still see flour, keep stirring. I can't see any more flour, stop. So that should be your thought process. Just simply stir until there's no more flour visible and then stop. Should you keep going? No, stop. All right, very important. Don't over mix. And at that point, we're gonna divide that between two coffee cups. And I know we're calling this a mug cake and you could certainly use two mugs, but I used a cup and I can't call it a cupcake for obvious reasons. But bottom line, any similarly sized coffee drinking receptacle should work. All right, so divide it nice and even. If you get any drips, wipe them up. All right, you should probably use a towel, but if no one's looking, just use your finger, it's fine. And of course, after those are cleaned up, we're gonna give them the old tapa tapa times two. And then once those are tapped on, we're gonna bring it over to the microwave and we're gonna set it on full power for 45 seconds. And you're thinking, there's no way, there's no way that's gonna work. Oh, it'll work. And of course, it's very hard to film into my microwave, but I did discover by standing in the way of the light, you could see a little more. And all I really need you to see is that nothing happens for the first 30 seconds, but that last 10 or 15 seconds, it will start to rise. It will start to souffle up out of that cup it may crust the surface depending on the size and shape of your cup or mug. And then that's it. As soon as you turn it off, it's gonna collapse. We're gonna pull it out and that's what it looks like. It looks like chocolate cake. All right, and you can see it steaming there. I guess you could dig in right now, but I really think you should let it sit at least two or three minutes. And no, I'm not sure why I'm touching it, but I am. I think the taste and texture definitely improve. So let it sit a few minutes. Of course, this will give you time to cook your other ones and or clean off the rim. You can just use your finger. What's that, someone's watching? Switch to a towel. There you go. And then before we dress one up with the ice cream and all that stuff, I just wanted to dig in and kind of show you what you're in for. I think because we use those mini chocolate chips, there's a little thin layer of melted chocolate between the cake and the cup. That's kind of cool. And as I pull this out, you're gonna see a very cake-like texture. All right, the flavor is gonna be pretty much the same. It's always the texture that's the challenge with these minute cake recipes. So because I'm using less batter than most of these recipes and I'm cooking it for much shorter of a time, I think we get really close to an absolutely passable chocolate cake texture. But to hedge our bets, of course, we're gonna dress it up. So I'm gonna dust it with some powdered sugar. And by the way, there's some kind of rumor going around that I don't like powdered sugar. That's not true. I just don't like it on French toast and pancakes. It's ridiculous. But on something like this, it's cool. And if you're wondering why I'm going around getting it on the edge of the cup and all over the table, that's for drama. And then after I dust it with the powdered sugar, we're gonna do one scoop of vanilla bean ice cream. Oh yeah. And I'm sorry, not to sound immodest, but if there's anyone doing better looking scoops of ice cream on the internet, I'd like to meet him or more likely meet her. 
But anyway, I'm very proud of my ice cream scooping skills. And then last but not least, a little dusting of the cocoa to finish this off. And just like the powdered sugar, you want to get some on the rim because we need a little more. That's right. Visual drama. You got to admit it is dramatic. And that's it. Transfer it to your saucer and dig in and take it from someone who ate one of these. It was really good. I mean, what's not to love about warm chocolate cake, especially one spiked with coconut almonds and chocolate chips topped with some melting vanilla bean ice cream. And when you combine that with the fact that this literally took less than a minute to cook and only a couple minutes to mix up, you're talking about a borderline supernatural phenomenon. And of course, during the summer, who wants to turn on the oven? Nobody. And with this minute chocolate mug cake, you don't have to. All right. Now, if you'll excuse me, I got to go work this off doing my eight minute abs. But I really do hope you give it a try. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. chocolate sour cream bun cake. That's right. This is as close as many of you will get to eating a giant chocolate donut. And of course, this is the chocolate cake that was seen in the creme anglaise video, which generated so many requests. And as far as chocolate cake recipes go, this is so foolproof, so unbelievably simple that if you screw this up, you should never bake anything again. All right. So for step one, we're going to get our dry ingredients together. You know those. They're the ingredients that aren't wet. We have some flour. Just regular white all-purpose flour, some white sugar, and then some baking soda, not powder, soda. And we're going to take a whisk, and we're going to whisk that for about 30 seconds to a minute or until thoroughly combined. And then we're going to set that aside while we prep our wet ingredients, which is basically going to look like hot chocolate. So over on the stove, I have a heavy bottom saucepan. We're going to place that over medium heat. I have two sticks of butter. By the way, the reason one's yellower than the other those cows ate more grass. So I did use two different brands of butter just because that's what I had. I'm also going to add some unsweetened cocoa, some water, just regular cold water, and some salt. And what we're going to do is we're going to stir this over medium heat until everything is dissolved. And you're basically going to have what looks like a pot of very, very rich hot chocolate. And do yourself a favor, don't use a spatula. So I just grabbed this because it was closer, and then I totally regretted it. Eventually, I surrendered and went and got a whisk. So very, very simple. Just keep stirring over medium heat until it starts to steam and everything is melted and it looks like that. And at that point, we're going to mix it into our dry ingredients. So I want you to make a little well in the center. I want you to pour in about half and start to give that a nice, slow, careful stir. And I like to do half at a time here so it doesn't splash all over because that will happen if you try to dump all this in at once. And the batter's going to tell you when to add the other half because it will get really hard to stir. And that's just the batter telling you, dude, put the rest in. So we're going to dump the other half of the chocolate mixture in there. And we're going to stir that till combined. It's only going to take like a minute. All right, one of the nice things about this recipe is it requires no electric mixers or anything like that. So a very, very simple procedure. All right, once all that's mixed in, we're going to add two eggs, one at a time. So plop an egg in, bust that yolk with the whisk, give it a mix. When that disappears, go ahead and mix the other one in. And you'll notice I'm transferring those into the batter from a ramekin, which is a nice trick because if you get a little shell in there, you can pick it out without trying to pick shell out of your batter. So I'm going to stir in that second egg. We're going to go ahead and put in a splash of vanilla extract and our sour cream. And I'm actually using a Mexican sour cream called Crema, which I had left over from another recipe, which worked beautifully. But just regular sour cream works, creme fraiche works. Really any dairy I think would work here. Cream, milk, buttermilk, stuff like that. All right, so we're going to mix that well. And once that's mixed in, your batter is done. So at that point, we're gonna spray a silicone bunt pan with some nonstick vegetable spray. I'm using silicone, you can use metal, works just about the same. By the way, some people like to use melted butter here and a little bit of flour. I just use the spray, but suit yourself. You are the boss of your bunt buttering and or greasing, okay? Once that's greased up, we're gonna pour in our batter. And by the way, is it just me or is that thing in the middle kind of crooked? I'm not sure what that centerpiece is called. Is that the bunt pylon? Is it the bunt buoy? So I'm not sure what that's called, but it wasn't a problem. So we're going to pour that batter in. We're going to give it the old tapa-tapa to settle that down before we put it in a preheated 350 degree oven for about 50 minutes or until it looks like that and a bamboo skewer comes out clean. And that one did. So what we want to do is let that cool for 15 minutes in the pan and then invert that onto a wire rack to cool all the way before we drizzle on our chocolate ganache which is the next step. 
which is so incredibly simple. And you've seen this before. We've done this many times. You simply take some chopped up chocolate. You pour over some boiling heavy cream. You let it sit there for about a minute. And then you slowly stir it with a whisk. And man, does it look ugly when you start. And you're thinking, somehow I screwed this up. Why did I listen to that Chef John guy? But then you realize, wait, it's coming together. So if you just keep stirring, it will turn into this beautiful, thick, shiny, glossy ganache. And there you go. That looks pretty awesome. So that's done, and we have to work with that while it's still liquefied. So we're going to go back over to our cake, which should be cool enough to frost by now. And we're going to take a spoon, and we're going to start drizzling and or spreading that chocolate ganache all over. Some people just like a few little measly drizzles. Other people like it completely coated. All right, I'm one of those people. So I like to really give it a nice thick coating. And then after it's completely coated, I'll go around and drizzle even more on. And once your ganache is applied, all you need to do is wait for that to firm up, which shouldn't take that long. That would happen very quickly in the refrigerator if you want to refrigerate this. But even out at room temperature, probably a half hour and you'd be ready to slice. And then you probably have figured out the rest. Cut yourself a nice big hunk. Throw it on a plate, possibly with some orange creme anglaise sauce. Possibly with just some vanilla ice cream. Possibly as is. And that is one sexy slice of cake, if I do say so myself. And let me tell you, for such a dead simple technique, just absolutely foolproof, kind of dense and moist without being heavy, just the right amount of sponginess, very chocolatey, not too sweet, has that little bit of subtle tang from the sour cream. It really is a fantastic chocolate cake recipe. And like I said, I got so many requests for this after the creme anglaise video. And of course, by requests, I mean threats, intimidation, extortion, and other strong arm tactics. Although in this case, it was appropriate, so thank you. So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Baltimore Peach Cake. That's right, everything I know about Baltimore I learned from watching The Wire which is why I knew very little about this cake. All right, they really didn't talk too much about old German desserts on the show. But nevertheless, when I did find out about this cake, which is really more of a bread, I was very intrigued and decided to give it a try. And what follows is my fairly successful first time attempt. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with the dough, which we will begin by adding some sugar to this bowl, along with a package of dry active yeast, which we will activate with some very warm but not too hot milk. Okay, something around 95 to 100 degrees. And you can use a thermometer if you want, but I just tested by feeling with my pinky, which I've had calibrated to be accurate within two degrees. And then we can go ahead and finish up these wet ingredients with some melted butter, as well as one large beaten egg. And that's it, we'll take a whisk and give this a mix. And once we can feel that all that sugar's been dissolved, we can go ahead and add our flour, which generally for things like this, especially when we haven't made them before, we don't wanna add all the flour at once. Okay, it's always much easier to add if you need it. And by the way, I'm using all-purpose here, although the word on the street is, is that traditionally some wheat flour was actually used also. So just something to keep in mind if you're into that kind of thing. So I dumped some in and gave it a stir. And after just a few moments, I could tell it was still super wet. So I went ahead and added in the rest and continued stirring until it was almost all incorporated. At which point I stopped and added the last ingredient, which is gonna be some salt. And yes, I'm pretty sure you could add this right at the beginning, but I'm always getting emails from people that are afraid the salt's gonna kill the yeast, and they ask me why I don't add it later in the process. So stirring it in at this point is dedicated to them. Or maybe I just forgot. There's really no way you'll ever know for sure. But anyway, I went ahead and mixed that up until I had a very, very wet and very sticky dough. And at this point I was wondering if it was too wet, and maybe I should add some more flour. But I kept thinking this is called a cake and not a bread. And I do want to keep it on the moist side and do not want it too dry. So I decided to leave it alone. And by leave it alone, I mean cover it with a damp towel and let it sit in a warm spot for about an hour and a half or until it doubles in size. And while we're waiting for that to happen, we can go ahead and prep our peaches. And for that, we will use some classic peach slicing technique, which means first find a seam and cut all the way around like this. And then give it a little twist to separate it into halves. And then once we pull out that stone, we are ready to slice this into whatever size pieces we want, which for me is going to be four pieces per half, which is eight pieces per peach. Oh yeah, Chef John's pretty good at math. Oh, and by the way, go ahead and peel these if you want, but I don't think you should, because I think it looks a lot better if you don't. 
and once baked, you do not even know those skins are there. And besides, we could probably all use a little extra fiber. But either way, we'll go ahead and slice up three or four peaches, depending on the size, or until we have enough to cover the top of our dough. Speaking of which, after about an hour and a half, mine had doubled and looked a little something like this. And as I proceeded to deflate this with my spatula, part of my brain was telling me, you probably should have added some more flour. This seems a little too wet. But another dumber part of my brain said, you know what, it's probably fine. Just keep going. So I did. And I went ahead and transferred that into a well-buttered baking dish. And what we're going to need to do once that's all been transferred in is take our spatula and attempt to pull it into each corner and then even it out as best we can. Which for something this elastic and soft and sticky is going to take you a few minutes. But the good news is, for whatever reason, that was surprisingly satisfying to do. And then what we'll do once that dough has been thoughtfully distributed is cover this in plastic and let it rise for another half hour to 45 minutes or until it roughly doubles in size again. And approximately 41 minutes later, mine looked like this, at which point we can unwrap it and we can top the top with peaches. Or if you like less words, we can top with peaches. And of course, we're gonna to wanna to make sure those all go in the same direction, so as not to annoy certain people who would be very upset if we had some go in one way and some go in the other. All right, you know who you are. But anyway, we'll go ahead and place those on as shown where we have them almost touching, but we can still see a little bit of dough in between. And we'll also want to sort of press those in a little bit so the surface is relatively flat. And then to finish this up, I went ahead and drizzled and brushed a little bit of melted butter over the top, maybe more than a little, like a couple tablespoons. And then last but not least, I finished this off by dusting the top with some Demerara sugar, which is sort of a large crystal light brown sugar, but just a light sprinkling of regular brown sugar or regular white sugar should work the same. And that's it, our Baltimore peach cake is now ready to transfer into the center of a 375 degree oven for about 40 to 45 minutes or until nicely browned and cooked through. And by the way, those times I just gave you are what I want you to do, not what I did, which was about 35 minutes. And we'll get to why in a second. But anyway, at this point I assumed this was cooked perfectly and I even tested with a toothpick, which came out clean so I thought it was good. But as we'll eventually discuss, that wasn't necessarily the case. But for now, let's forget about that and just focus on how unbelievably gorgeous this is. I mean, come on, look at that. But not for too long, please. Because if we're gonna glaze this with jam, which I am, we wanna do that while it's still hot. So what we'll do is take some peach or apricot preserves and heat that up with a little touch of water so it's brushable. And we will go ahead and give the top a very generous glaze. Which by the way, I'm told is kinda controversial. Okay, some folks consider it mandatory while others will say it's an abomination, which is kind of harsh. But anyway, I'm a glazer from way back. So given the option, I'm always gonna go with the glaze over the no glaze. And that's it, once we have that brushed on, we will simply let this cool all the way down to room temp before we try to serve it, which was not easy, but I did. And then once cooled, I went ahead and cut a slice. And at first glance, I was very excited and thought I had had beginner's luck and it was perfect. And I have to say that first bite was absolutely delicious. Okay, it was sort of like a peach sweet roll or a peach cinnamon roll without the cinnamon. But then I realized that the dough directly underneath the fruit hadn't quite cooked enough and was still a little bit doughy, which wasn't necessarily an unpleasant experience, but was a little bit odd texturally. And that will be a lot easier to see when I use the fork here. So yes, next time I think I will add a little more flour so the dough's a little stiffer. And I'm probably gonna leave it in the oven for about five to 10 extra minutes. In fact, it was such a moist dough, I probably could have went until the top was almost too brown and then pulled it out. So fair warning, you are probably gonna to need to adjust this, which is fine, since you are after all the Omar Little of this not being too doughy in the middle. But overall, for a first attempt, I was extremely happy with how this came out. And it really is sort of unique. I mean, it's not a bread or a cake, it's some weird hybrid. But of course, since we are calling it cake, I had to test to see if it would work with ice cream which it did, by the way. So to summarize, with a few minor tweaks, I think this would be an absolutely fantastic recipe to break out in the middle of peach season. Or even with other fruits like plums or cherries or berries. I really think this would work well with all those things and more. But anyway, that's it. My first attempt at Baltimore peach cake. Believe it or not, I've heard the original recipe called for sauteed onions on the top as well. And no, I'm not kidding. So if you happen to try that and it works, send me a picture. 
Otherwise, I'll just finish up by saying, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Chocolate Decadence. That's right, if the person you're trying to seduce this Valentine's Day is a chocoholic, you may want to consider this classic 1980s dessert. And by the way, if you don't remember the 80s because you're too young, or you don't remember the 80s because of the 80s, it was a decade known for greed, decadence, and excess. And there's no other dessert recipe that typifies those things as much as this chocolate decadence. So let's throw on some leg warmers and possibly a members-only jacket if you're chilly. And let's get started. And for this, we'll begin with one of the last things we need, a buttered and floured 9-inch pan. Just take your pan and smear in a light coating of butter. And once you've done that, we're going to dust that with flour. And we'll give that a shake and kind of roll it around until the flour coats the inside. And then just tap out the excess and your pan is prepped. And I'm pretty sure you could figure out a way to do that without making such a huge mess. But that's okay because I have one of these, a bench scraper, which makes cleaning up something like this a lot easier. So I recommend you get one of those. But anyway, I'm gonna clean that up. We'll also clean up our pan a little bit. And by the way, does it look like that because I didn't spread my butter that evenly? Yes, yes it does. But anyway, that's it, our pan's prepped and we will set that aside while we make our batter, which is gonna start with butter, just a little bit. I'm gonna add about 10 tablespoons of unsalted butter to a mixing bowl, to which we're gonna add a whole bunch of chocolate. And not just any chocolate, I want you to use semi-sweet chocolate. And just in case you're wondering, this is 62% cacao. I guess I could have just mentioned that in the ingredient list, but I really wanted to say cacao. And what we'll do is we'll take a whole bunch of that and chop it or break it up into the bowl. If you want to cut it up with a knife, go ahead. If you want to pound it with a mallet and break it up like that, go ahead. But I just like to break it up with my fingers, mostly because I really enjoy the cleanup. And once that's set, we'll head over to the stove and place this bowl on top of a double boiler. So what you want to do is put about an inch or two of water in a saucepan, bring it to a simmer, then turn your heat down to the lowest setting you have, and we'll place our bowl of butter and chocolate on top, where it will slowly and safely melt. And once it does, we'll simply stir it together, which is what I started to do here. But then I realized not all the chocolate was melted yet. So I went back a couple minutes later, at which point I was able to stir it together. And for my money, stirring together melted chocolate and butter is one of the most beautiful food scenes of all time. Check it out, so pretty. And then once that's stirred together, we're just gonna turn off the heat and leave it there until we've prepared our egg mixture, which is the next step and requires five whole eggs and not cold eggs. So I guess you could leave them out at room temperature, but what I like to do is just let them sit in warm water for about 20 minutes, at which point they're gonna be much more beatable. And then what we'll do is we'll take a large bowl, the bigger the better, and we'll dump in some white sugar, not too much, and we'll add our eggs, and we'll take a whisk, and we will bust those eggs right in the yolks, and we will start to beat them. And we will continue to beat them until we have a very pale, very, very, very thick mixture. And by the way, this step is super easy if you have an electric mixer, which I do. But I thought I'd take one for the team and show you that you can do this by hand. But it is going to take a while, so fair warning. As most of you know, I'm in incredible shape and freakishly strong. And even with that, this took me about 10 minutes to do. But anyway, we're going to keep whisking that until it gets super, super thick. At which point, we're going to add a couple more things. We're going to do a very, very tiny shake of cayenne. As you know, a little bit of that can make chocolate taste chocolatier. As does the next ingredient, a super, super, super tiny pinch of salt. And I mean barely a pinch, just a tiny bit of salt. And then we're also gonna sift in a little bit of flour. Not too much, just over a tablespoon. So while you hear chocolate decadence referred to as a flourless chocolate cake, it actually does have a little bit of flour. Then we'll take our whisk and we'll stir that in. And then once that's set, it's time to mix it with our chocolate. So let's go ahead and take our bowl of chocolate and butter and what we're gonna do is we're gonna pour in about a quarter of our egg mixture to lighten this up. Just pour it in and mix it in until it looks like chocolate again. And hold on one second here. That little drip is totally bugging me. That's better. Okay, so like I said, we're gonna mix in about a quarter of our egg mixture. And then we're gonna go ahead and add that mixture back into our bowl of eggs and fold it all together. And I say fold, but it's really more of a stir. Okay, so don't think we're making a souffle here. You're not gonna end up with a super light airy mixture like you would if we were working with a true meringue. But we do wanna mix this as gently as possible. So as you can see, I'm kind of folding, kind of stirring, bringing stuff from the bottom up over the top when possible. And what you're gonna end up with is a very, very light for its size batter. And it really should look something like this. And once our chocolate and egg mixtures have been incorporated together, we will carefully transfer that into our prepared pan and we'll even that out. And that's pretty much ready for the oven. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to give it the old shake a shake -a, but no tapa tapa. Just give it a little shake to make sure things are evened out, at which point we will transfer that into the center of a 425 degree oven for exactly 14 to 15 minutes. And 14 or 15 minutes later, it will look like this. Okay, that surface will be just barely set. If you give it a little shake, you won't see any waves of chocolate. It may wiggle or jiggle slightly, but it will not look soupy. And there's really not a way to test it by poking, like we can with other recipes. But the good news is 14 to 15 minutes will be perfect. And at this point, I have some terrible news for you. You can't eat this yet. This cake is not good warm. It's not even good room temperature. What we have to do is let this cool to room temp before wrapping and refrigerating or freezing thoroughly. All right, so just make sure it's very, very, very cold before you try to cut it. But once it is, you're ready to slice a piece and serve it on top of this. Fresh raspberry sauce. The mandatory and only approved sauce to pair with this cake. And by the way, I'm happy to announce that's going to be the next video. So I'm going to show you how to make that. And you're going to be glad because it's so delicious and so versatile. So we're going to cover our chilled dessert plate with our raspberry sauce and top it with a piece of our now very cold chocolate decadence. And of course, to add to the visual drama, we will dust it with a little bit of powdered sugar, which I was doing way too slowly, so I edited. And then for a final touch, we'll add a few fresh raspberries. And that is one beautiful and pretty dramatic looking dessert. And of course, depending on the personality of your Valentine, you could go a little more conservative and just do like a pool of sauce in the middle of the plate, but that's up to you. You are the Ronald Reagan of what to put your chocolate cake on. But anyway, gorgeous appearances aside, Let's go in for a taste. And they do not call this chocolate decadence for nothing. This is by far the richest, most intense, most decadent chocolate cake of all time. I would describe it as kind of a compressed, super rich chocolate custard, which is why you have to have this raspberry sauce. I mean, we really need that tartness, that acidity from the berries to cut through all this. That's what makes this work. And you want it to work, don't you? So like I said, stay tuned. I'm gonna show you that sauce next. So whether you're trying to impress your Valentine or just nostalgic for the 80s and want to get your Gordon Gecko on, I really hope you give this amazingly intense chocolate cake a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. New York style cheesecake. That's right, finally, after all those requests some New York style cheesecake. I call this sunshine cheesecake because of a certain couple secret ingredients. All right, we're gonna start with the standard graham cracker crust. And I'm always amazed in the store when I see people buying this pie crust frozen. It's graham cracker crumbs and butter. Do not buy this pre-made, so easy. So we're gonna smash that up, add enough butter, enough melted butter to make something that will pack. See that? Something you can just sort of pack like a sandcastle. And then we need one of these, a nine inch spring form pan. That's the only thing to use for this. I rub that with vegetable oil, so that's greased. All right, we're gonna pack our crumbs in the bottom, make sure they're very firmly pressed down. I go up a little bit up the sides, maybe a half inch. All right, set that aside. Now, if you thought the crust was easy, where do you see the filling, so easy. In a bowl, I'm gonna take some flour, some sour cream and some vanilla, and I'm gonna mix that together. Now I have kind of a specific order. I like to put the things together. There's so many different techniques you can use. This, this one works for me though. All right, so once those are mixed together, I'm gonna set that aside. I'm gonna take a large bowl with four packages of soft room temperature cream cheese. Very important, because I'm gonna add my white sugar and with the back of a wooden spoon or spatula, you should be able to easily cream that sugar into the cheese. And speaking of cheese, no secret ingredients here, just your standard from the state of Pennsylvania cream cheese. So once the sugar's creamed in, I'm going to add my milk and start to stir that. At this point, I'm like, hey, switch to a whisk. It'll be easier. And it was. And like most batters, we only want to mix it enough to incorporate the ingredient. So as soon as that milk is mixed in, stop. All right, don't keep whisking. Once the milk is mixed in, we're going to put in four eggs one at a time. So drop one in, mix it just till it disappears or almost disappears, and then the next one. Once the four eggs are in, we're gonna add lemon zest and orange zest. And that's the reason I call it sunshine cheesecake because that bright citrusy note, just a little, about a teaspoon of each. Once that's in, we're gonna mix in our sour cream mixture from earlier. Again, we're just stirring enough to mix it. You don't wanna introduce a lot of air into a cheesecake batter, right? It's not a light, fluffy dessert. It's one of the few desserts we try to make it dense. We don't want it airy and light and fluffy. All right, so once that's done, we are going to transfer that into our springform pan. 
put it on a sheet pan, and then give it the old tappa tappa. And the old tappa tappa is just a couple taps on the pan to sort of settle the batter. Don't call it the tappa tappa. It's the old tappa tappa. Tappa tappa just sounds ridiculous. All right, that's going to go in a 350 degree oven for one hour. And here's the secret. After one hour, turn off the heat and let it cool in there for three or four hours. That way, it definitely will not crack. They only crack if you overcook them. If your cheesecake goes over about 160 internal temperature, it'll crack like this. Sorry, I couldn't do it. I was going to show you the Photoshop one, but mine had a crack. Now, I have an excuse. I was playing around trying to get shots of it in the oven, so the temperature went down, so I gave it some extra time. The good news is, if it just goes over slightly, it still tastes amazing. The texture's perfect. Do not worry. By the way, that's like the largest crack I've ever gotten on a cheesecake, which, ironically, the one I'm videoing. But it's totally fine. Tasted amazing. And then, of course, there's all kinds of tricks. If it does crack, that's why people use that cherry pie filling. That's why people use fresh berries. Okay, you can cover it up. Or, like me, I'm going to use those cracks as a cutting guide. It's almost so convenient, I'm glad it cracked. But anyway, the point is, do not be afraid to make cheesecake. It is one of the easiest recipes ever. If it doesn't crack, great. If it does crack, as mine did, who cares? It's still going to be great. So whether it cracked or not, make sure it cools completely before you try to cut it. I serve mine with some fresh strawberry sauce. I will also demo that. Super easy, super delicious. And there you go, New York cheesecake. And you can see how that fork is going through that cheesecake. Just the absolutely perfect, classic New York cheesecake texture. All right, firm, but not dry and crumbly. Just very dense and decadent and rich, yet surprisingly light at the same time. And I think that little bit of lemon and orange zest in there really brightens up the flavors and makes it seem a little lighter than it is. I love this recipe. Make this for the holidays. Make this for any occasion. It's one of the world's great, great desserts. Incredible. I hope you give this a try. All the ingredients are on the site, as usual. And as always, enjoy. Carrot cake. That's right, out of all the vegetables people have tried to make cakes with, only one hit it big. And that was the humble carrot. And I know zucchini did get a bread, which is kind of impressive. But still, it is a bread, so carrot wins. But vegetable-based dessert rankings aside, I'm very excited to show you this. And we'll go ahead and begin that by getting together our dry ingredients. And I'll start with a couple cups of all-purpose flour, to which we will add some salt, as well as some baking soda and baking powder. Oh yeah, we're doing both this time. And then as far as spices go, we'll do some ground ginger as well as a couple spoons of cinnamon. And that's it, we'll simply take a whisk and give this a thorough mixing to make sure all those ingredients are nicely combined. And once that's been accomplished, we'll simply set that aside and start on the wet ingredients. And we'll begin that by adding a little touch of sugar to this bowl, into which we're gonna whisk four large whole eggs. And by the way, if you're thinking, hey, sugar's not a wet ingredient. No, it's not physically, but the baking and pastry chefs consider it a wet ingredient in these recipes. And since they tend to be kind of a temperamental group, we let them call it what they want. But anyway, we're going to whisk those eggs and sugar together for a few minutes until it all looks a little something like this. At which point we're ready to add our melted fats. And we're doing two kinds here. We're going to do some unsalted butter as well as some coconut oil, which kind of sort of looks like vegetable shortening at room temperature. Except according to my sources, it's way, way healthier for you. And I'll give more info on the blog about exactly which one to use. But anyway, what we'll do is place that over low heat until it just melts. All right, we don't want this too hot, just until it melts. And if you think it did get too hot, just let it sit and cool until it's just warm. And then what we'll do is go ahead and whisk that into our egg and sugar mixture, which we were probably supposed to do gradually, but I don't and didn't, and it works fine. So we'll go ahead and stir all that together, at which point it's ready for the star of the show, our carrots, which we are going to need to peel and grate first. And that might not sound like something you need a tip for, but I'm going to give you one anyway. And that's that if you grate a carrot at an angle, you're going to get longer strands, which I don't really want here. All right, by doing the carrot not at an angle, more perpendicular like this, you're going to get much shorter gratings, okay, much smaller pieces, which I think works better in this recipe. And sure, that probably means this will take an extra minute or two, but I think it's worth it. Of course, having said that, any way you do this is probably going to be fine. 
And if you think about it technically, no matter how you do it, you're doing a great job. But anyway, we're going to need to get about two generous cups, which we'll go ahead and transfer into our wet ingredients, along with some crushed pineapple, and if you're using them, some nuts. And I am. I'm going to do some pecans and walnuts. And once those are in, we'll go ahead and give this a stir. And because I wanted it to be harder and take longer, I used a nice small spatula. And then what we'll do to finish this batter off, after switching to a bigger spatula, is we'll go ahead and add our dry ingredients and stir this all together. And basically that's it. As soon as everything's incorporated and we can't see any more flour, we can go ahead and transfer this into a lightly buttered baking dish. And I'm just going to do it in one big rectangle because it's way easier. But if you want to fill up a couple round cake pans and do a layer cake instead, feel free. I mean, you guys are, after all, the Dwight Schrutes of desserts made with roots. Which reminds me, assistant to the carrot cake maker is not the same thing as assistant carrot cake maker. All right, totally different pay scale. But anyway, we'll go ahead and transfer that batter in, at which point it's pretty much ready for the oven. But before that happens, let's go ahead and give it the old tappa tappa, which hopefully will bring any big air bubbles up to the surface. And that's it. Once that's been accomplished, we can go ahead and transfer this into the center of a 350 degree oven for about 40, 45 minutes, or until it looks like this. So yes, it looks done, and totally gorgeous. But we never just want to go by looks. So to be sure, let's go ahead and poke it with a toothpick. And if it comes out clean, you're done. And if it comes out with a bunch of wet batter on it, you're not. Put it back in. But this was perfect, which means all we have to do now is let it cool completely. Repeat, cool completely before we frost it. If you're going to frost it, by the way. Which I hope you are. I mean, only a crazy person eats cake without frosting. And what I have here is our official Food Wishes cream cheese frosting, which I will, of course, provide a link to. And we'll go ahead and spread that evenly over our completely cooled cake. And just for fun sometime, try to spread this cream cheese frosting over a really hot cake. Just to see what happens. I don't want to spoil it, but it's not good. And then what we'll do once this has been successfully frosted is pop it in the fridge for at least a couple hours so that that frosting firms up nicely and we get some beautiful clean cuts which is what I'm going to pretend we did right here, even though I didn't. And the reason for that is I really wanted to grab a fork and see how this came out, since it had been about 10 years since I made this recipe. But you really do want to wait for that frosting to firm up, because as you'll see as I cut this corner piece, those edges of our frosting are going to be a little bit sloppy and messy. Not to mention we might end up with an unsightly frosting fingerprint right in the middle, which is never a great look. And by the way, it's just not an appearance thing. The taste and texture of the frosting will be better if it's cold. But despite the aforementioned issues, the cake itself was amazing, and every bit as good as I remembered it was. All right, there's basically two styles of this, the light, airy, cakey version, and then the sort of dark, dense, very moist version. And what I enjoy is something right in the middle of those, which I think this was. So I was thrilled with how this came out, but not necessarily how it looked. So I let it chill completely so I could get one more cut with nice clean edges. You know, for the pictures. Which is why I garnished the top with a little bit of chopped pecan and a few slices of candied carrot, which I will tell you how to do on the blog. And even though I just did a tasting, I figured as a professional I really should take a couple more bites of the one I photoed. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. But anyway, that's it. My take on carrot cake. We got Easter coming up pretty soon. And when I think of Easter, I think of rabbits. And when I think of rabbits, I think of carrots. And when I think of carrots, I think of this delicious cake. Although, why do we think of rabbits again when we think of Easter? Oh, that's right, the eggs. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Hummingbird cake. That's right, I'm not sure if this is the best cake ever but it is certainly the best cake ever named after a bird. And when you consider what a proven crowd pleaser this is, and just how simple and easy it is to make, maybe it is the best cake ever. And depending on where you're from, this is either one of your favorite cakes, or you've never heard of it. And if you're in that last group, it only takes making this one time to be in the first group. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And other than buttering and flouring a couple cake pans, the only prep we need to do is dice up some bananas. And for this, you're going to need about three medium-sized ones, which of course we're going to peel. 
at which point we'll cut it in half, and then we'll slice it in two lengthwise, and then once more down the middle, and once that's set, we'll turn them and cut them across into about quarter inch slices. And of course, you can cut these as large or small as you want, but the bananas do need to be very ripe and sweet. Okay, not mushy. We still need to be able to cut them, but still they should be fully ripe. And for this recipe, we'll need about two cups total. And that's it. Once our bananas are prepped, we can move on to this extremely easy batter, which will involve adding some white sugar to some all-purpose flour. And then to that, we will add some ground cinnamon, some baking soda. No, not baking powder, baking soda. And of course, some salt. And that's going to be it for our dry ingredients. And we'll take a whisk and give that a quick mix before moving on to the wet stuff, which will include a lot of vegetable oil, as well as three beaten eggs. And what we'll do once those have been added to the bowl is grab a spatula and we'll mix this until we basically have something that looks like mud. Delicious oily mud. And by the way, it's that oil that gives this cake its unique moist texture. So don't be afraid. And once we've spatulated that until it looks a little something like this, we will stop and add the rest of our ingredients, including some real pure vanilla extract, followed by a cup of finely crushed canned pineapple, Although yours doesn't have to be finely crushed, right? Some recipes use larger chunks so that you can see the pineapple in the cake. But personally, I prefer something nice and small as I think it produces a moister texture. But of course, suit yourself. And then after that, we can go ahead and add our diced bananas, followed by a whole bunch of chopped pecans that you should probably lightly toast first in a dry pan since that does make them taste better. And that's it. We will grab our spatula and mix this until it's thoroughly combined. And just a heads up, it's going to be super stiff and firm when you first start mixing. But fear not. After about a minute, it's going to loosen up. And by the time you're done stirring all this together, you should have a nice pourable batter. And that's it. Once our batter ingredients have been battered into a batter, we will divide that equally between two 9-inch buttered and floured cake pans. And I should mention, traditionally this cake is made in three layers. But personally, I think two is easier. It saves us a little bit of work. But anyway, you decide. I mean, you guys are after all the Dr. Birds of whether this should be divided in the thirds. And by the way, this cake's original name was Dr. Bird Cake, which is the name of the hummingbird in Jamaica where this originated. So just a few fun facts for you. But whether you do two or three, before these go in the oven, we're going to want to give them the old shake a shake followed by the old tapa-tapa, which of course is going to settle down the batter and bring any air bubbles to the top. And that's it, our cake is now ready to transfer into the center of a 350 degree oven for about 35 minutes or so, or until they're beautifully browned and hopefully look like this. And just to be sure these are done, we'll go ahead and test it with a skewer, which should come out clean and mine did. And if it comes out dirty with raw batter on it, put them back. And then what we'll do is let these sit and cool for about 10 minutes before we remove the cake from the pan by inverting them on a cooling rack. And if you generously buttered and floured your pan, these should come out pretty easily. And that's it. Once those have been deep panned and racked, we will let those sit for at least an hour or until completely cooled. Since I don't know that much about cakes, but I do know you can't frost them warm. Speaking of which, while those are cooling, let's go ahead and make our cream cheese frosting, which is going to start with one pound of cream cheese, plus one stick of room temperature unsalted butter. We'll also do a little splash of vanilla extract. And then using a whisk attachment, we will go ahead and cream this together before we add our powdered sugar. And of course, as usual, you might have to scrape down the sides with a spatula. Except please turn off the machine when you do it, since doing that with the machine running is not very smart. But anyway, like I said, we'll go ahead and cream that together until it's nice and light and fluffy. At which point we'll stop and add one box, which is one pound of powdered sugar. And they say you're supposed to add this in three or four additions, but you know what? They say a lot of things. So what I do is just add it all at once, and then I'll just start very slowly turning the mixer on and off to get it started. And then once it starts getting incorporated, we can go a little faster. And this method really works great, unless all the butter and cream cheese get stuck in the middle of the whisk. And then not so much. So I had to stop and clean that out of the center, after which things went a lot better. And once that sugar does get incorporated, we can turn our mixer up to high, and whip this for a few minutes until it's very, very light and creamy. And by the way, believe it or not, this is the Chef John Extra Light version of cream cheese frosting, which only has half the butter and half the sugar of the classic recipe. But to me, taste and texture-wise, is still absolutely perfect. 
So I'm not sure exactly why they're putting in all that extra butter and sugar, but trust me, you don't need it. And that's it once we have a beautifully light and creamy and fluffy spreadable frosting. We can move on to frosting and layering our cake. So I'm going to place one layer down on an inverted cake pan and then transfer on about half our frosting or whatever amount of frosting you see fit. And we always want to start with a pile in the center and then spread that out towards the edges. And since we're going to press down with the second layer on top, we do not want to go all the way to the edge. So I'm going to leave about a quarter to a half inch unfrosted. But anyway, once we have that first layer of frosting spread, we'll go ahead and place over cake layer number two, and we'll give that a firm but gentle pressing. And that's it, we'll make another pile of frosting on the top, in the center, and again, spread that towards the outside. And by the way, I learned the inverted cake pan trick in culinary school. Since we didn't have enough cake wheels to frost on, and you can go around with a spatula frosting the sides, and you don't have to worry about it hitting a plate or the table, and of course, as I was doing this, I remembered I'm not going to frost the sides. So basically, I put it on this upside down cake pan for nothing. Although maybe in the future you will find that tip handy. And even though we're not going to top this with a third layer, I'm still not going to frost all the way to the edge. Okay, I think it just looks a little neater and cleaner and more professional if you leave like a quarter inch all the way around unfrosted. Alright, I can't explain it, but it does. And that's it. Before we decorate this and serve it, we have to chill it thoroughly. So I'm going to go ahead and transfer that onto a sheet pan and pop it in the fridge. And no, I don't have any idea why I left it on the pan. Or usually once in every video I do something I have no idea why. But anyway, the point is we want to chill this. At which point we can put that on a cake stand. And then top that with a hummingbird we made with candied sugar. Which I wasn't going to show you how I did, since I didn't think you could do it anyway. But then I felt bad for thinking that, so I'm going to show you. Alright, I just drew a template and put it under my silpat. And then cook some white sugar until it was molten hot and amber colored. And then I simply dripped and drizzled that over my pattern. And in a few short terrifying moments later, had what sort of kind of looked like a hummingbird. And did I nail it on the first try? Uh, no. The one you see me making here cracked. And then made a few more which didn't crack but looked terrible. But then finally on the fourth try, I nailed it. And that's the one you actually see on the cake. And when Michelle heard I was doing a hummingbird for the top, she thought we should add some edible flowers as well, which I thought was a great idea. And I went ahead and placed those beak adjacent, since I don't know much about hummingbirds, but I do know they like to suck on flowers. Hey, join the club. And that's it, my hummingbird cake was fully garnished and ready to enjoy. So I grabbed a knife to cut a slice, but I couldn't bring myself to break the bird, so I moved it over. But anyway, I cut a piece, which came out pretty good, but not good enough for the plate, so I cut a few more until I got one I was happy with, and went ahead and plated that up with a few extra flowers. And that, my friends, is one of the best cakes you will ever taste. All right, if you like carrot cake, and you like banana bread, there's like a 100% chance this becomes your favorite cake. And while it is pretty sweet, it's not that sugary one-dimensional kind of sweetness. All right, thanks to the bananas and pineapple and pecans, it's a much more interesting kind of tropical sweetness, which reminds me of the story of how the cake got its name. Okay, apparently whoever invented this in Jamaica thought that the cake's nectar-like sweetness would even attract hummingbirds. Or at least that's the story they tell. All right, part of me thinks the real story of how hummingbird cake got its name is much, much darker. Oh, and if there was ever a cake to pair with a cream cheese frosting, this is definitely that cake. Just a perfect combination. And on a personal note, I don't like a ton of frosting, so I didn't actually use the whole recipe, which means I have a little bit extra to spread on something else to be determined at a future date. But anyway, that's it. My take on hummingbird cake. And by my take, I mean I copied exactly L.H. Wiggins' recipe, which was published back in 1978, which according to historians was the first time it was printed in America. But origin stories aside, this is a truly delicious and beautiful cake, which is why I really do hope you give it a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts a printable written recipe and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Russian honey cake. That's right, there are basically three different ways you can make this amazing cake. The hard way, the harder way, and the way we're going to do it, the hardest way. But it's all going to be worth it. Because once you're finished, you're going to be enjoying one of the most beautiful and delicious cakes of all time. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And the first thing we're going to need to do here, comrades, is burn some honey. 
So let's go ahead and transfer some honey into a saucepan that we will place over medium heat. And in case you're keeping score at home, I'm using a wildflower honey, but I have to think pretty much any honey is gonna work in this. And I know I just said we're gonna burn the honey, but that's not really true. All right, all we're really gonna do is cook this until it's like one shade darker and sort of takes on the aroma of caramel, or as I pronounced it all my life, caramel. And yes, it is insane I'm using a pan this small because it is probably gonna foam up and you do not want this boiling over on your stove. So you go ahead and use something a little deeper. But anyway, I went ahead and cooked mine for about 10 minutes or so until like I said, it kind of darkened up a bit and I started smelling that distinct aroma of caramelized sugar. And then once we push that as far as we want to go, what we'll do is turn off the heat and whisk in a little splash of cold fresh water, which will immediately stop this from cooking any further, plus make the texture a little bit thinner once it cools. And then once that's set, we'll push it to the back of the stove and we'll place a large metal bowl over our lowest heat setting, into which we will toss a whole bunch of butter. And for the record, this bowl is supposed to be placed over simmering water and not directly on the flame. But just like when I make hollandaise, I like to live dangerously. And as long as we have a really, really low heat setting, this will be fine. And then to the butter, we will also add a touch of white sugar, as well as some of our recently burned honey, plus some regular honey. And then what we'll do to this is absolutely nothing. We will simply let it sit there until our butter melts. And while we're waiting, what we should do is take some baking soda, not powder, baking soda, and add some salt to it, as well as some cinnamon, because we're gonna be tossing that in in a few minutes. And then what we'll do once our butter melts, or almost melts, is go ahead and give this a whisk, and leave it over the heat until it's very warm to the touch. All right, not super hot, and not just barely warm. And then what we'll do once that is very warm to the touch is go ahead and add six cold eggs, and we'll go ahead and whisk those in. And relax, this is not so hot that it's gonna scramble those eggs. Which reminds me, if your eggs scramble, it was too hot. And what we'll do once our eggs have been mixed in is simply keep this over that very low heat setting until the entire mixture comes back to that very warm temperature. And sure, a temperature would help here, but you're not getting one. You have to learn to use the force and your fingertips. And then what we'll do as soon as that mixture does feel very warm again is go ahead and stir in our baking soda cinnamon mixture. And you'll see just after a few minutes of stirring, the mixture is going to change color and get much lighter and it will sort of look thick and foamy. And that's because of all those little tiny bubbles that the baking soda is producing. And then once that's been stirred in and our mixture is hopefully looking a little something like this, we will remove that from the heat into some better light. And we'll go ahead and finish this up by sifting in some all-purpose flour, which we generally don't want to do all at once. So what we'll do is sift this in two or three additions. And as soon as one addition has been stirred in, we will add the next. And once all that flour has been added and stirred in, we should be looking at a somewhat thick, but still fairly runny and easily spreadable batter. So that is looking just about perfect right there. And then what we'll do to form our layers of honey cake is transfer just shy of about half a cup onto the Silpat line baking sheet. And then using ideally an offset spatula, we want to spread this out into about an eight or nine inch circle. And since I have like zero cake making utensils and tools, I just spread mine out using a rubber spatula. But if you Google offset spatula, you'll see what you're supposed to use. And yes, as you can tell from the dirty Silpat, I actually did a few before I filmed this one. But don't worry, this one came out just as bad. And then what we'll do once that's set, is give it a quick shake and then the old tapa tapa to knock out any big air bubbles. At which point we're gonna cook this at 375 for about six to seven minutes or until it looks like this. And that's it, we only have to do that seven more times. Which is why it's an advantage to have more than one pan and one silpat. And no, my oven didn't magically clean that silpat while it was baking. This was a shot from the other pan I was using. And the shot just happened to be a lot better. But anyway, what we'll want to do as soon as that comes out of the oven is very carefully slide it off the pan and onto the table, which is going to allow it to cool a lot faster. And then after about six or seven minutes, it should be cool enough and firm enough to remove from the mat. And by the way, even though the surface looks pretty smooth, you'll see as I flip this upside down onto this piece of parchment, underneath you will have some spots where bubbles have formed. But do not worry about those. As you'll see, that's not going to cause any problems and you should be pretty shocked if each layer does not have a few of those. But anyway, I went ahead and did seven more of those, stacking them up with parchment paper between the layers as I went. But I stopped stacking at three, because as you can see in this shot, those first few I piled up sort of stuck to the paper, because this is a relatively sticky cake because of the honey, 
So I stopped stacking those and just ended up spreading them out on the table like this. And then once all your layers are totally cooled, we can take a plate, in my case a paper plate, and trim around them making sure they're all the same size. And not to brag, but all mine were really close. But even so, I did grab my pizza wheel, and I went around so they all had a beautiful, nice, clean edge. But anyway, that's optional. Although if you do it, save the scraps, since we can actually add those to the crumb mixture with which we're going to coat our cake. And if you're wondering what crumb mixture, well, the crumb mixture we're going to make with the extra batter. Since if everything goes according to plan, after you've done your eight layers, you should have just about this much batter left, which we will just spread out onto our baking sheet. And we will cook that for about 10 minutes, at which point we'll go ahead and cut this up into smaller pieces. And the whole reason for this is if we left it whole, I think those outside edges might get too dark and possibly burnt. And not burnt honey burnt, like actually burnt. So by making what's basically cake croutons, I think this is all going to cook a lot more evenly. So we will cut, toss, and go ahead and pop that back in for about maybe 7 to 10 minutes more, or until fairly well browned. And by the way, we can also do that with any of our trimmings from earlier. And that's it. Once that's all cooled, we can go ahead and give it the old bag and bag until we have some fairly fine crumbs. And then once that's set, we can move on to the last major component, our creamy filling slash frosting, which we're gonna make in a very cold bowl with a very cold whisk. All right, keep those in the fridge until you're ready to use them. And then into that, we will pour two pints of very cold, heavy cream. Okay, when you whip cream, it has to be very cold, especially if you're gonna do it by hand like I do. And of course, go ahead and use your electric beaters if you want. But by doing this by hand, I'm going to burn off the exact same amount of calories as one slice of cake, give or take 300 calories or so. And what we want to do here is whip this until we have soft peaks, or what would be a more accurate name, floppy peaks. And then what we'll do once we've achieved those is go ahead and add the rest of our burnt honey, as well as a couple nice big spoons of sour cream. And of course, the regular sour cream to cream ratio is going to be up to you. But I'm going for a fairly light filling, so I have like four parts cream to one part sour cream. But anyway, we'll go ahead and add that, and then continue whisking until we have fairly stiff peaks. All right, we don't want to go too far and make butter here, but we do want this mixture getting fairly stiff because it has to hold up all those layers. And when I reach that stage, it looked like this. And that's it. Once our cream's done, we can start to assemble. And for this first layer, I went around and trimmed off the parchment right up to the cake, which is going to give us something to slide our spatulas under. And then we'll go ahead and transfer on a generous cup at least of our whipped cream and spread that out as evenly as we can, almost up to the edge. All right, we don't have to go all the way because the next layer is gonna press it down. And speaking of the next layer, you wanna place a side that has the divots from the air bubbles facing up. That way when we spread on the cream, it's gonna fill in. And of course, as you're putting these on, you're giving them a nice gentle press. But anyway, we'll continue creaming and caking until we have one layer of cake left. And unlike the other ones, this last layer I like to put with the nice side up. So maybe save your smoothest best one for last. And that's it, we'll go ahead and frost the top. And if everything goes according to plan, you should have just enough whipped cream to go around the sides as well, which I barely did. And if you don't, don't worry about it. Just tell people you're doing the rustic version. And you know, there are so many activities involved with cooking that I find very therapeutic. And frosting a cake is way up that list. All right, it just feels really good. And it makes you feel really good. And because of that, while you're doing this, that cake is absorbing all those good feels. Which is why when your guests eat this, they feel good. Or at least that's what I assume happens. But anyway, we'll go ahead and spread over the rest of our whipped cream. And then to finish our cake off, we're going to cover it with our crumbs. And for that, I'm going to use the old ricochet method, where we let the crumbs fall against like a bench scraper or a piece of paper like this. And they basically bounce onto the cake and stick onto the whipped cream. And personally, I like to go for full coverage. Although you do see a lot of versions where just the top is crumbed, or just the sides are covered, and the top is left white. But anyway, presentation's up to you. I mean, you are for all the Vladimir of your crumb veneer, and it's up to you to decide how you should be putting these on. But anyway, like I said, I like to cover the whole thing, at which point we can do a little bit of cleanup around the base. And then I have some horrible news. We have to refrigerate this overnight, or longer, to enjoy it in all its glory. And during that time, that whipped cream is going to kind of soak into the layers. And they're going to get even moister and more luscious. So do not try to eat this as soon as you make it. Although if you did, it probably would still be really good. But I did go ahead and pop mine in the fridge overnight. 
And by the way, I actually did cover it in plastic. I just didn't film that since this video is so long. And then a day later, I went ahead and pulled it out, at which point I performed the always terrifying maneuver of trying to transfer it onto a cake stand with two wobbly spatulas. But as you can see, that went pretty well. And speaking of things going well, cutting a nice neat first slice out of one of these big cakes is not the easiest thing to do. But much to my surprise, that also worked out better than expected. So I grabbed a fork to go in for a taste. And please note, those toasted crumbs are just not for a garnish. They really do help accentuate that caramelized honey flavor in the cake. And then as far as the cake itself goes, it really is shockingly light in texture, but with a very profound, deep, deep honey flavor. Right, that tiny little amount of bitterness we get from the burnt honey step really is the secret here. And then that slightly tangy whipped cream frosting is just absolutely perfect for this, since not only does it provide a little bit of acidity, and of course a lovely light texture, but unlike most frostings, it is not too sweet. Right, the only thing we used to sweeten that was that little bit of burnt honey. So to summarize, I was very happy with how this came out. And I celebrated by cutting another slice so I could do a fully food style plate and then take some pictures. And more importantly, eat some more. But anyway, that's it. My take on Russian honey cake. And no, it's not easy to make. And it does take a lot of time and effort. But it is so, so worth it. And that's coming from someone that doesn't even like cake. So whether you're making this honey cake for your honey's sake, or you're just in the mood for a challenging bake, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below to get the ingredient amounts, the written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.